My friends, tonight is diorama time, featuring this Grizzled Ice 2 from Berlin 1945. My inspiration comes from this historical photo, and I'll try to capture the essence of it. After I laid down the basic styrofoam mockups, I could establish the length of the scene, which is 30 centimeters. In case you've seen my previous dioramas, I always started with a plank of low quality styrofoam, but this time I'm basing this scene on a piece of cardboard. It actually comes from the kit box, and the reason for that is I want to make an oval base instead of the traditional rectangle or square. There are tutorials on how to draw an oval using a compass, so feel free to check them out if you'd like one yourself. Now I could cut the shape, very carefully mind you, so there would be no kinks. And just to be on the extra sure side, I lightly smoothened out the oval with a sanding sponge. A quick check of the composition and I think we're good to proceed. The entire point of this was to glue the cardboard base to a piece of styrofoam using double sided tape. This way, the cardboard cutout will act as a cutting template. It's something I tried in the past and the good news is, if you have a foam cutter, the hot wire won't burn through the cardboard, so you can draw and cut any shape you want. I've also cut all the important elements of the diorama using this method. Sometimes I fix them temporarily using toothpicks, in other cases I glued them right to the base with double sided tape. You gotta make sure the cutting wire is set exactly at 90 degrees, otherwise it'll cause a mess. Either way, the cut won't be always perfect, but it's still a great starting point. So that's the basic shape of our diorama, and I kinda speed ran you through this process because everyone likes the actual construction and painting techniques, so let's get to that ASAP. Starting with the brick wall, I again carved the bricks directly into the styrofoam. Although bricks are never a quick job, I find this method much faster than making individual pieces and gluing them one by one on a styrofoam or cardboard template. There's of course very little room for mistakes, but if you measure twice and cut once, everything is gonna be alright. Bricks are one of the most satisfying surfaces for me because you can play around with lots of patterns, textures, color combinations and all kinds of weathering effects, so the tedious work at the beginning is always worth the fun during the painting stage. I especially like the flexibility of this material and how you can easily add all kinds of damage and basically sculpt the terrain behind it, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Building complete houses from this material is also fun, as I've done already in my Normandy diorama. So that's the brick wall finished and glued in place. Next up is another man-made structure, the bridge. The quickest way to build it was using the styrofoam blocks as a template and the main construction material was a 0.4mm plastic sheet from Evergreen. This way I knew the structure will be stiff and the geometry should remain perfectly in check. I used PVA glue because plastic cement will destroy the styrofoam and although it's not designed to hold plastic together, it worked pretty well and nothing fell apart. Once the sides were laminated, I gave them a quick round of texturing using diluted Tamiya putty. The bridge will be rusty and even the slightest hint of steel texture will help me during the painting process. The remaining beams and steel profiles were constructed from 2mm evergreen strips. I'm not much of a scratch builder, but it really pays off to have these at hand, as the results are much better than cutting strips of styrene by yourself. Rivets were punched from tin foil, and here I'm using a 1mm drill bit inserted the opposite way in a pin vise, so only a small portion of the blunt end is protruding. You can shoot them out of the foil like a rivet making machine gun and it costs nothing. Another handy trick is gluing the metal rivets with plastic cement. The softened plastic, or in this case putty, will allow them to sink a little into the surface, creating a pretty strong structural bond and the job is super clean, unlike using super glue. So that's the bridge, ready to be glued in place. Yes, sadly I'll have to paint it attached to the diorama. 
Next up, I had to prepare a few sections of the scenery. The fake bottom of the river was covered in a thin layer of lightweight acrylic putty, just to create a sturdy surface and to protect the styrofoam from epoxy resin. The banks of the river were sculpted from VMS Smart Mud, which is this absolutely awesome diorama clay. I'll talk about it in a moment. The main reason for this preparation was concrete slabs for the riverbank. I decided to make them from sheets of cork, those you'd normally use under a hot plate. And why didn't I make them from styrofoam, you might ask? Well, I don't want the epoxy resin touching any kind of styrofoam at all, that's one reason. And second, after I textured the cork with acrylic wood putty, I could add these awesome and ultra realistic cracks because cork has a very good texture for this. It's also a great material for building asphalt roads because it's sturdy and those cracks are super easy to make. So after gluing them in place I blended the upper edge with more VMS clay and blended the transition between the brick wall and the dirt path using real earth from my garden. With the bank finished I could glue the bridge in place. Yes, I added the railing and some quick wood planks, just to be on the safe side, although as you'll see, none of them will be visible in the end. Here I had to make sure the sides were sitting perfectly flush with the base, because all of this effort led to the next, very important step, laminating. For this diorama I chose a 0.4mm thin veneer, and to make my life easier, I've cut the sheet against the wood grain, not along it. Having no experience with oval bases until now, I thought it would be easier to bend the wood over the round shape. Now it was just a problem of actually fixing it in place, firmly and securely. Basically, I started at the bridge, and I fixed this starting point with a generous amount of super glue. The rest was about gluing one small section at a time, and I basically started by squeezing a lot of PVA glue behind the wall, hoping it would spread out and create a firm chemical bond. I didn't have anything to hold the wood in place, so I pressed the diorama against my manly, so to say, chest and poured a lot of super glue at the top. And you thought working out would have no effect on your modeling. Well, I hope this summed up the process because it wasn't very exciting. Of course, I was left with a few gaps, but those were mostly easy to fill with super glue. And once everything was dry and firm, I sanded them as flush with the oval shape as humanly possible. Before I could trim the excess veneer, I had to construct the remaining elements of the diorama. The most tedious and unnerving step was making the tree bridge. Here I had to make a whole ton of logs from dried up twigs until I had a small chopped down forest, although even this pile is only scratching the surface. So why was it unnerving? As you know, my garden is my favorite and only source of natural materials, and for this diorama I picked it totally clean of any twigs laying on the ground. Seriously, my garden was never cleaner and I have a lot of trees there. But okay, fixing them in place was about, well, laying them on a pile and then sprinkling some dirt on top of them. I worked in a few levels, so to say, and each was fixed like this. Firstly, there would be dirt in real life and secondly, the earth mixed with diluted PVA glue would lock them in place, like concrete. Not to mention, I could seal the bottom layer with earth, so no epoxy resin would start pouring out into the void and eating through the styrofoam bridge or something. The top layer required full length locks, and this is where I was stretching my resources very thin. But hey, somehow I had just enough tweaks and not a single one went to waste. This is also where I applied a lot of dirt as it would be carried here by passing vehicles. It's basically a corduroy road and those seem to be packed with mud and dirt all the time. The main body of the terrain was sculpted from the VMS clay again, and what I wanted to say is that this is a final production batch that's available online now. 
The first time I used it in the previous diorama it was a prototype, and compared to that one, this one is moister and it sticks to the surface much better. But you also have to leave it for a while before you can start imprinting tracks or whatever into the surface. But it's still super cool and it's one of my favorite diorama materials ever. Okay, now I could finally trim the excess veneer and because it's only 0.4 millimeters thin, it was almost like cutting paper. Well, carving intricate shapes out of stiff wood is never fun, but it's one of the main reasons I like this material. You can construct a smooth, seamless wall even if the actual surface of the diorama is very messy, such as a pile of logs. With the tree bridge finished, I wanted to see how the tank's gonna look in place. This is why I kept the suspension movable and removable. See? <laughs> because now I could slice off these positioning knobs that hold the swing arms at an even height. And now, with the suspension alive, so to say, I could fit and glue it in place so it would perfectly match the uneven corduroy bridge beneath the tank. Pretty nifty, huh? <laughs> so, when the tank finally found its proper place in the scene, I could now better guess where the dirt road would be. Of course, it would be totally destroyed by passing tanks and other heavy vehicles, so I just added a few ruts with a paintbrush and the rest was created by pressing the original plastic tracks from the kit into the soft VMS clay. Once that was hard, I flooded the surface with diluted PVA glue. It's easier to add texture in this manner because the loose dirt would bounce all day long, but when the surface is wet and sticky, it'll stay in place. This was my usual assortment of fine dust, larger clumps of earth and whatnot, and I fused it with the diorama by soaking the loose dirt with alcohol and then dripping more PVA glue on top of it. I also sprinkled some dried seagrass next to the road to sort of visually separate these two sections of the ground. Once everything was dry, I brushed random clumps of undiluted PVA, trying to combine larger uneven shapes with smaller blobs. This is our bed for grass, and I applied it with a static grass applicator. It's been a while since I did this because my last two dioramas were torn up World War I battlefields and it's a very satisfying process, let me tell you that. I only used one length, uh, roughly 5mm, because the reference photo shows almost nothing and something tells me that grass wouldn't have the best living conditions in a place like this, you know, frequent traffic, all the rainwater would get drained down the wall and into the river, that kind of stuff. Not a good time for the grass. So anyway, my friends, this is the final look of the constructed diorama. Every element is in place, although I'd prefer painting some parts individually, but you know, the composition, the way things are laid down just didn't allow for it. Let's move to the painting workbench. This is one of the most toxic substances ever, so a proper gas mask with at least 30 minutes of air filters is a must. Okay, I know how everyone loves it when I spray over everything with a thick layer of black primer, but that's just who I am, you know. It's my way of making dioramas and how I approach their painting. Okay, I won't deny that it would be possible to paint the individual elements carefully without priming. For example, the brick wall could be painted with a paintbrush and the ground could be treated with enamel effects just to give it some extra variation. Huh, actually now that I said it, maybe we'll try that sometime in the future. But yeah, in the case of this diorama, it was the best course of action because there are lots of tight places where I won't be able to reach, such as under the collapsed bridge. And now I'll quickly show you how every element was base coated with an airbrush and Tamiya acrylics. The grass started its life with this dry, sandy tone. It gives the finished grass more variation. Then I gave it a generous, but only partial, treatment with a vivid green mixture. The thick black primer helps to create artificial shadows in the grass, making it look denser and more lively. Finally, a super vivid tone was added in small amounts. I just added more yellow to the previous mix and sprayed it over the top of each tuft. The brick wall was sprayed with this pretty dark rusty color. 
Once again, the black primer helps to build artificial shadows between individual bricks, making the brickwork look, you know, more three-dimensional. Then I kept making the color lighter by adding more yellow, just like with the grass. And I found this approach more efficient than painting each brick in a different tone using a paintbrush, as I did with all my previous attempts. The truth is, brickwork in a real life isn't that random, and just a few different tones here and there are more than enough for a base layer. The trees were painted in different grayish tones. Here the primer does most of the heavy lifting, because there are a lot of shadowed places on this bridge. Also, varying the opacity of the color adds even more tonal variation, because the underlying primer changes the tone to a more grayish, dull tone. We'll make the tree bark more evident with paintbrushes, but for now, this will do just fine as a base coat. And, of course, the exposed sections where the trees were cut are supposed to be bright, and this was also very fast when done with an airbrush. The rusty bridge was painted using the same colors as the brick wall, but here I started with pure hull red, sprayed unevenly, and once again, the black primer and how opaque the paint is gives the surface its own unique tone. Some variation was of course added with the yellow, but this might serve as a good example showing how you can achieve different textures with the same colors if you vary their intensity. Concrete slabs were picked out with a warm grayish tone, just don't use white because it would look very unnatural. The bottom of the river was painted in the same color as I'll use to tint the epoxy resin. It should give it a sort of bottomless feel. And finally, the ground received two semi-translucent coats. I tried spraying the earth zones from above, so the loose stones would cast their own shadows. And the primer can give us some trouble here, because even though I used the same paint for weathering on the tank, here it has a different tone, thanks to the black undercoat. But I think I'll adjust it with enamels. So that's the base with every element picked out in its respective base color. From raw materials, through a uniform coat of black, to this vivid, sort of smooth, because it's airbrushed, look. Let's now treat each element separately and give it a unique finish. This one is already finished, nothing to do here. I just love happy vivid grass. <laughs> here it's not gonna be so easy, but it's gonna be heaps of fun. I started by adding a very uneven layer of mortar between some bricks. I'm using lightweight acrylic putty from Berg's work, and I gotta say it's an awesome medium for this job. Previously I tried using wet plaster or a dry mix of plaster and fine sand, but this process is much cleaner and faster, and I think the result feels more authentic. And now I could give it a nice acrylic weathering treatment. I like to add more remnants of the mortar with a few selective filters using diluted white. Just you know, here and there to differentiate a few bricks. To blend it more with the ground, I added heavy filters and streaking effects using diluted light mud from Vallejo. This also gives them a nice, weathered, dusty look. So much so that it can be used to differentiate even more bricks, making them look older. Darker tones were added with black-brown, and I focused it around the damaged sections where bricks are missing. Some subtle streaks of dirt running down those holes, some extra variation over the bricks, a few washes for the mortar lines, it's endless fun. Finally, some mossy residue towards the bottom, because moisture can and will cause such effects. And it adds more visual interest, so it's an absolute win on all fronts. And that's the finished brick wall. A quick base coat with an airbrush and a few effects added with diluted acrylic paints. It's very easy once you get the hang of it, and you'll never get bored. One might find this surprising, but I used the same color palette to paint and weather the concrete slabs. It's the different base coat that gives them their own unique look, and the weathering visually ties them together with the brickwork. I just had to keep in mind that concrete affected by water has a slightly different finish than usual. I found a few reference pictures where I found large accumulations of dark, grimy patina and large remnants of algae. 
The cracks were emphasized with black paint, and this might be very over the top, but it kinda works in the grand scheme of things. Adding a white outline under the crack gives it a more three-dimensional look. And okay, maybe I'll try a more subtle color next time because the white is really strong and unnatural. I gotta admit that. And the algae was created with fine turf from Woodland Scenics. It's basically crushed foam and you can make it at home from a kitchen sponge and a cheese grater. Not with those together, but you get the point. This stuff was also painted, and it's my usual technique for painting moss. However, here I added more variation by making the lower portions darker. Once again, observed in reference pictures. Okay, good, another element is done, and soon enough, half of them are gonna be flooded with murky river water. This is a large metal structure, so I had to give it more attention. The first coat was a layer of chipping fluid, then a thin, uneven layer of German grey, which is an excellent color for raw steel finishes. This paint was scratched and chipped to give it a nice textured look. I based this on a reference photo where the bridge wasn't completely rusted out. After sealing this effect with flat varnish and giving it another coat of chipping fluid, I sprayed a light coat made from German grey and white. Two layers of this mill scale were visible in my references, and I think it'll give it a pretty unique texture, differentiating the bridge from everything else in the diorama. Rivets were quickly highlighted with a dark grey color, this is also visible in many reference images, and larger spots of mill scale were painted with a paintbrush. This is a pretty interesting effect, and it looks odd, that's for sure, but that's almost how it looks in real life. Just large, random spots of grey mixed with smaller patches, almost like chipping for exposed steel finishes. I proceeded with an enamel pin wash and I chose this tone because it would also give the surface a grimy, weathered finish. So I wasn't too worried if there was too much excess paint, I just blended it outward creating stains and emphasizing shadows. Finally, the steel texture was completed by blending various tones of rust-colored enamels. I tried to be random, but not chaotic with their placement, and some stains were used to blend and tone down the brush applied mill scale. Some enamels tend to leave glossy stains called tide marks, so you might need to fix those with a quick blast of flat varnish, but overall, these dry to a completely flat authentic looking finish. And it was achieved with these pigment jockeys from VMS. Ever heard of them? Me neither. That's because they're brand new and I kinda helped VMS with their development. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, cool. So the bridge is also finished and we already have three important elements out of the way. Let's now focus on the least fun part. This was the only place where I wished I kept it in its raw color, but then again I wouldn't be able to add more variation to this pile of wood. For example, I painted some logs to make them look like birches. These will stand out pretty nicely, I think. Painting the remaining trees individually would drive anyone insane, including me, so I opted for the dry brushing method. Each log was treated with various mixtures and intensities of dark grey, black brown, very dark reddish brown, it's actually called mahogany brown, and so on, based on reference pictures. The bark texture was emphasized with medium and light grey. Even when I was walking outside and looking at trees, their trunks are mostly very dark brownish grey with strong hints of green. That's moss, of course. So I started doing that by giving them a generous wash from diluted oil paints. The same ones I used on the tank actually, Industrial Earth and Sepia from 502 Abteilung. Then my favorite step when it comes to wood, blending slimy grime from ammo for those moss accumulations. I went pretty heavy with this effect because the mass of grey wood needed some additional color. And also because a lot of it would get toned down with earth colors. The top of this bridge is packed with earth, so I sprayed a thick layer of buff over each patch of dirt. 
That's the so-called pre-dusting technique, because it acts as a base code for enamels. This is where I'll bridge the topic from the bridge, <laughs> see what I did there, to the groundwork, because they both kinda blend together with this technique. As I was adding the enamel earth effects, I realized how the corduroy bridge is connected to the groundwork, especially the dirt road. So I quickly treated it in the same manner, blending heavy mud enamel effects from ammo and adding a few selective washes made from oil paints using the wet blending method. In other words, adding more paints over a layer of wet paint. The only exception was the road, where I added the oils more selectively and more carefully into the track marks. It's a very efficient way of bringing out various terrain features, because sure, we place them there, but sometimes they're too small or too shallow to stand out on their own. As such, I highlighted them with the dry brush method, using a light earth color. And it wouldn't be my diorama if some of the individual stones weren't picked out using various acrylics, now would it? Sometimes it helps to paint those in specific locations, for example, sandy and earth colors can add more variation, but lighter tones can suggest rocks, pebbles or gravel. A large number of bright colored stones at the bottom of the crater might suggest you know, all the rocks that are underground, but they were exposed by the shell impact. So that's the groundwork and the tree bridge all finished up. Note how I used earth colors to blend the tank tracks with the tree locks. Not only does it make sense that the trees would get dirty from passing vehicles, but it also visually ties the tank and the ground together. And now for the best part. It's time to make the river, and that means meticulously taping it off and creating an improvised dam. Tamiya tape is more than enough for small amounts of resin. Speaking of which, it's again gonna be my favorite resin water from AK. The process is simple, mix it in a 2 to 1 ratio and your success is almost guaranteed. I had no idea how much water would I need for each layer, so I started with 8 milliliters of resin and 4 milliliters of hardener. Stir, don't shake, because that would introduce more bubbles than needed, and then I tinted it with 7 drops of khaki trap. This is a lot of paint and the resin became pretty much opaque. Um, to see, you know, not a great thing, but not too bad either. At least the fake bottom of the river will remain invisible. I repeated the same procedures as with my 1917 diorama, which actually became one of my most successful videos, no doubt thanks to the epoxy water, and this time I really enjoyed the process. Everything was sealed tightly and the shape of the river was simple, so it was an easy pour. Removing the air bubbles with a blowtorch is one of the most satisfying things in this process, in fact in the whole modeling world, and it leaves us with a perfectly clean and smooth surface. I poured the first layer at 9pm and left it to cure overnight, of course sealed in a plastic container so it wouldn't catch any dust. The next morning at 9am sharp I was met with a rock hard glass like surface with no leaks. Whew, <laughs> absolutely perfect. Knowing that I'll need a lot more resin this time, I mixed it in a 20ml and 10ml ratio, adding only 5 drops of paint, making it more translucent. I did the same thing, pouring it evenly, spreading out with an airbrush needle so it would touch everything that should be touched, and then I poured in the rest. This way you'll be sure the resin will spread out evenly. There were a ton of bubbles in this layer, but that made the blowtorch even happier and I was more satisfied with the process. Cover it up once again and get back to it in the evening. 10 pm sharp and I'm once again met with a river shaped glass surface. What a day, or should I say evening, am I right? The final layer was once again 30 milliliters in total volume, but I added only 2 drops of paint. I'm mentioning these ratios for everyone's sake, including me, so next time I can get back to this video and remember that you need only a couple of drops of paint for a large volume of resin. 
that's of course if you want to see at least something under the water surface. This one had the bubbliest personality of the bunch, and my Dremel blowtorch was singing from happiness as it was bursting all those bubbles. Seal it up for the final time and leave it like that overnight. The next morning I was once again, I know it's hard to believe, met with yet another glass-like surface. What a way to start the day, my friends. So I quickly ripped off the tape and I was met with this interesting color transition. It works pretty well with the black outline on the veneer, right? Well, not wasting any time, I trimmed the raised edge where the resin crawled up on the Tamiya tape and treated the sides with glossy varnish from Tamiya. It looks so good, I wanna taste it, but I don't recommend biting too hard. Okay, let's now destroy this beautiful surface with waves. I wasn't so sure what texture a flowing river has, especially if it's partially blocked with a collapsed bridge, so I looked up some references. Lo and behold, the actual river in Berlin was exactly what I was looking for. I don't know how you pronounce it in English, is it Spree? Because I think Germans pronounce it as Spree or whatever, right? <laughs> anyway. It was the same texture as I made in my 1917 diorama, but I added some extra contours with an airbrush. Once the gel was dry, I added another, thinner layer, this time stippling it with a soft paintbrush and pushing it sort of towards the bridge. Basically, even a calm, flowing river has a very chaotic surface, and this might represent it pretty well. The final stage was adding water foam with a dedicated AK product. Well, I never used it before, but as it turns out, the application is simple. Just be absolutely sure where you want to place it, and less is definitely better. It totally makes sense around the bridge, and even if it's not totally authentic, it looks pretty good, I think. Where it didn't look so good were some of the larger waves. The bad news, it's impossible to remove, so I had to hide it with some airbrushing and whatnot, uh, pretty much ruining the surface, that's the point. I know, this is so sad, but I take it as a lesson for my future self. So yeah, that's the river finished! The final element is a resin figure from Evolution Miniatures. This is my first experience with this brand, and if every figure from them is as good as this one, then I'm totally sold. I painted it using my traditional glazing method, which I've meticulously described in a dedicated video, so here's instead the finished soldier. I enjoyed painting every part of this miniature, and to be as efficient as possible, I was painting it while the resin water was drying. So I super glued him in his honorable spot, and the last touch was painting the sides of the diorama black, so all your attention would be directed towards the scene, not the fancy veneer treated with some fancy wood stain, right? And that's the finished diorama, my dudes and dudettes. What do you think about it? It's based on a historical photograph, although I didn't copy it to the last detail. Um, for example, in the photos there are Polish ice tubes passing the river, but I really wanted a Soviet one with those invasion stripes and bears painted on the turret. After all, that's why I named the diorama Bears Crossing. Like those road signs you have in America and Canada, right? Sometimes it's fun to copy a historical picture to a T, other times it's more enjoyable to be inspired and take some elements from a photo or even multiple photos. Well, I certainly had fun with this scene, except for the tree bridge, but I kinda knew that would be a chore. However, I kinda wanted to build this diorama for many, many years, pretty much, pretty much since I saw those photographs for the first time. I just didn't know back then that I would be into dioramas so much, so now it was the perfect excuse to finally give it a try and pull it off to some extent. It took me a little over two weeks from start to finish, and I'm glad it's now gonna be a part of my collection. But hey, this is probably my longest video so far, and that means you've probably stopped watching at this point, so I'm just gonna give my usual copy-pasted speech, okay? So, thank you for watching, my friends, and also thank you to my patrons who make this show possible. 
if you like what I'm doing and want to get more of it and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of rewards would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench. We can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos so you could watch the next video right now. Uh, I mean, if there is gonna be a video next week because I kinda wanna surprise you with another full diorama video. So yeah, then also these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. And last but not least, some real life references for dioramas, sceneries and landscapes. And of course small 3D models for detailing your tanks and dioramas. Okay, so that's gonna be it for this one and I need to go and clean my workbench. I also resumed my house renovations and that means I have to ratio my time between work, aka modeling and filming, and modeling in a real life scale on my home. I also want to make another diorama that should be pretty simple and small and thus I want it to be a surprise for all of you as a one compact video. So I'll try to make it into one episode, okay? And you, my friends, stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Maybe next week, maybe in two weeks. Cheers!